Guess I talked enough. Let's bring her in, Carolyn. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, very excited about this program. Uh, this program was prepared for the Society of Civil War Surgeons and it really took off. Something here for everybody. There is, uh, this guy is pretty interesting. He was a Bridgeport doctor for over 50 years and Bridgeport city of our birth, you know, we're just uh, my birth, very interested in Bridgeport history, but um, this gentleman uh, was really an extraordinary man. He lived in a extraordinary life. He lived a very long and a very good life. And so why don't we get started right, right now? Um, I have to do a couple of things for Dave because Dave left me some notes. So let me get this ready to go and then we'll start the program. And... Okay. All right, are we all set, Dave? Okay. All right, so remarkable life of George, Dr. George Loring Porter. Mm -mm. I get a frozen mouse. Sorry, everybody, getting started. Okay. All right, we had a little freeze problem. So, anyway, this uh, gentleman, George Henry Porter, was born in Concord, New Hampshire in 1838. And his mother, like many women, uh, is determined to name her daughter Betsy after her best friend, Betsy Loring. Well, Betsy turns out to be a boy and uh, he gets named after his father, but he uses his middle name for the rest of his life. And that's his mother, uh, Betsy's uh, best friend's uh, last name. So George Loring Porter. Uh, his mother is very determined. She's determined he's going to be a scholar and he was. He was very, very bright boy. His parents um, sent him to some of the best uh, schools in New England. And um, as a college uh, age young man, he goes to um, Brown University where he graduates by Beta Kappa, class of 1859. And during his college years, he decides to join the Baptist church. He remains a devout Baptist for the rest of his life. And um, he's a teetotaler. Uh, if you look at the slide here, you're gonna see uh, George with his two other siblings. He's the oldest of three. Uh, you're gonna see a picture of George as an undergraduate. And you're gonna see what Brown University looked like when he attended it in the 1850s. So the Porter family relocates to Pittsburgh before the Civil War, and um, George decides he's going to study medicine. And like many uh, doctors uh, in the 1800s, his medical education is going to be by reading medicine with uh, a, a, a man who's already a doctor, basically an apprenticeship where he just follows the doctor around and uh, he then becomes a doctor when uh, his uh, mentor determines he's ready to do so. Medical education in the 1800s was uh, very, very crude. Most doctors were not, what, no doctors were licensed. There were no licensing regulations. Uh, you just hung out a, she uh, a shingle and you, you began to practice after you had enough uh, learning. Learning was, uh, took place on the job, usually as an apprentice, but Dr. Porter is going to be um, a little different than most. He wants a better education. He wants more. He also wants to be a surgeon. So he winds up going to um, Jefferson Medical College, which is one of the most prestigious medical institutions in the uh, pre-Civil War years. 
Uh, he enters in 1860. He pursues the two-year course of medicine. That's all it took to be a doctor, two-year course of medicine. And the second year of learning was exactly the same as the first. So that's how he became a doctor. He studies under two of the most acclaimed doctors of uh, the 19th century, um, Dr. Jacob DaCosta and Dr. John Hill Brenton. So this begins his, uh, I guess, Forrest Gump uh, like ability to connect with the most famous people in his, uh, his America. And um, so he, these two men mentor him. He graduates with his MD in 1862. Civil War is raging. And he passes the Army medical examination with flying colors, which is amazing because so many people failed that. And he immediately, before he's even a commissioned officer, reports for duty in the Shenandoah Valley. In the 1862, uh, Valley campaign is raging. Uh, Dr. Uh, George Loring Porter reports on May 10th, 1862 to Major General Banks, who you see there in the lower right hand corner. In the Shenandoah Valley, he reports in Strasbourg. Yeah. Virginia. And you see a picture of him um, before he's commissioned, but when he gets down to business. Now, General Banks has a lot of problems in the Valley, as most of you are aware, the Valley campaign is still studied at West Point today. It's a brilliant campaign by Stonewall Jackson, and uh, he pretty much runs uh, General Banks out of the Valley. And Dr. George Loring Porter is already, already treating wounded. Uh, he is in this church that you see here uh, in Strasburg, Virginia. It's um, a beautiful church, still uh, there today, still a place of worship today. And Dr. Porter is captured by uh, uh, Colonel Ashby Turner, Stonewall Jackson's brilliant cavalry commander. And uh, then he meets with General Jackson and General Jackson assigns Dr. Porter personally to treat Union and Confederate wounded at the Presbyterian Church in Strasbourg. And there you see the church right there. Now, um, the Valley, it, Valley campaign is 15 major battles and 45 smaller ones in the Shenandoah Valley during the uh, Civil War. Uh, caring for the wounded from these fights, as well as from others, including Antietam, Gettysburg, would overwhelm so many of these small southern towns. Churches, houses, barns, many other structures are pressed into service as hospitals. And this church, Strasburg Presbyterian Church, uh, built in 1830, is going to treat the wounded of both sides. Hallmark of the Civil War uh, armies, uh, if you are wounded, you're an American boy, you're automatically a non-combatant and both sides uh, treat you uh, as best they can to the best of their ability. This is what the church looks like today. It's on Holiday Street in Strasbourg, still used for services. Um, purportedly those white wooden columns you see uh, in front of the church are hewn from single trees. Um, Porter serves here for several weeks. He's technically a prisoner of war, but he's given all the freedom he needs to treat the wounded and the sick who are cared for in the pews of the church. So Dr. Porter stays in the church and occupies or sleeps in the pulpit, which is that area behind the altar rail. Uh, the people of Strasbourg were very friendly. They were caring, they were polite. Uh, Porter acknowledged to them that he was an abolitionist, but he made a lot of friends with the townspeople. The townspeople brought food and delicacies to the hospital for both Union and Confederate patients alike. In 1915, Dr. Porter is attending the Grand Army Reunion in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Porter meets some of his enemy friends in Washington, D.C., and they invite him back to return to the Strasburg Presbyterian Church. He goes and he attends Sunday services, 
And uh, at the request of the pastor, he's asked to stand in front of the church and reoccupy the pulpit, which he uh, occupied as a young uh, surgeon and to speak to the con congregation. And he spoke about his time as a doctor at the church. He expressed his pleasure that after waiting 53 years, he was now able to thank the members of the church for the permission granted him as the surgeon in charge to use their building for healing and saving men's bodies. Um, just a note for those Turner Ashby fans, Turner Ashby would be killed on June 6, 1862 at the uh, Battle of Harrisonburg. There was a, uh, a, um, a, an engagement there. Um, and um, Dr. Porter believed most of his life, he was a good historian, he believed most of his life that his assignment by General Jackson on May 24th where he's told to treat the wounded of both sides in Strasburg Presbyterian Church is the Civil War's first recognition of the right of medical officers to claim protection as non-belligerents under the rules of war. Um, he may have been correct. Uh, his assignment and services at this church predated the signing of the Winchester Accords, which some of you will uh, remember. Um, his assignment by Jackson predates the accords by seven days. Um, this is uh, Hunter Holmes McGuire, uh, uh, General Jackson's um, uh, surgeon in charge of uh, his, uh, his uh, army. Uh, and it must have been on both Jackson's and Hunter Holmes McGuire's minds that something had to be done to get the wounded of both sides the best treatments they probably, they possibly could. And so Hunter Holmes McGuire goes to General Jackson, he comes up with this protocol, which he takes all the the seven uh, surgeons that you see here on the list, and he has them sign. And this protocol really establishes the fact before the Geneva Convention is even uh, a glimmer in anybody's eye in Europe that, um, that uh, Confederate and Union doctors and surgeons and caregivers who are captured or come under fire are going to be um, given uh, uh, the status of um, medical personnel, even if they are captured prisoners of war, and they're gonna be given leave to continue to treat the wounded to the best of their abilities. And this is a pretty revolutionary uh, thing. Um, uh, Secretary of War, even though these doctors sign without permission from the uh, US government, um, Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, is going to follow this up with uh, orders, special orders number 60, which immediately and unconditionally frees all the Confederate doctors that the Union is holding prisoner. So it becomes a reciprocal agreement. It will break down frequently during the war. But again, hallmark of the American Civil War is that if you are a wounded, no matter what side, Union or Confederate, both sides treat you to the best of their ability. Um, so pretty revolutionary. So anyway, 1862, his commission finally arrives July 17th. All this happens without him even being a commissioned officer. He's just treating wounded to the best of his ability. Um, um, he's commissioned an assistant surgeon in the US Army and 1862 are some crowded months for him. His service in the Valley is a whirlwind. Um, after the Battle of Cross Keys on June 8th, Porter establishes a hospital for wounded of Blanker's division. On June 12th, he's transferred to Winchester to serve in hospitals there. On July 1st, he's assigned to Best Battery and serves with that battery during the summer and was present at the Battle of Cedar Mountain on August 2nd, combat along the Rappahannock and the battles of South Mountain, Crampton's, Turner's, and Fox's Gap, which precede the Battle of Antietam. He's ordered and serves from September 17th to November 18th at the Barracks Hospital, which some of you will be familiar with, at the Old Hessian Barracks in Frederick, Maryland, um, where he serves as an executive officer under Dr. Robert F. 
Weir, um, another famous medical name in the 19th century. He um, had met his future wife, uh, Catherine Maria Chafee, when he was a student at Brown University. After his graduation in 1859, he returned home to Pittsburgh. He studied medicine uh, and um, entered Jefferson Medical College. Uh, and then he was uh, assigned uh, after the army medical examination, he was assigned as a Civil War surgeon, uh, serving on the front lines of battle. Um, he um, receives a leave of absence in November and he immediately leaves Frederick and rushes home to Providence, Rhode Island to get married to um, his, uh, his wife, Catherine Maria Chafee. They marry in um, Grace Church in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, he's immediately dispatched again to the front lines. The couple uh, has a long and happy marriage um, and um, they would have uh, 12 children. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So immediately after his marriage, he's dispatched right back into the front lines as an assistant surgeon this time at the, in the 5th United States Cavalry Army of the Potomac. And he serves in rapid succession at the battles of Fredericksburg, Beverly Ford, Brandy Station, Gettysburg, Todd's Tavern, Fleming's Cross, Roads, Manassas Gap, Kelly's Ford, Middletown, Upperville, Williamsport, and Boonesboro, where he is wounded in the left arm. He he catches some lead, whether it's shrap shrapnel or whatever. Um, he's he, these assistant surgeons especially serve right on the front line. They go right after the wounded. They advance like today's uh, corpsmen do, right in the front lines with the of combat and uh, and um, serve right there. Funkstown, Falling Waters, Beaver Dam, uh, Dam, Warrington, Ashby's Gap, Front Royal, Culpeper Courthouse, Morton's Ford, and the Wilderness. And he is often performing surgery and life-saving um, uh, medicine right on the field of battle. And I just forgot to do something. Let me just knock that off. I don't know how that happened. Okay, and it's, okay, sorry about that. That was kind of blocking things. So, uh, yeah, won't let the uh, thing advance. So, this quote I got from Dr. Iris Farr, which some of you um, may know from, he's an orthopedic surgeon in um, Connecticut. He was a battalion surgeon in Vietnam. And I was at a talk that he was doing once and uh, he, he made the remark that the smell of a blood soaked uniform never changes. And um, I was preparing this presentation. I was like, well, Dr. Porter must really understand what that means. So, um, I want to read to you uh, what his commanding officer is going to say at his promotion meeting. He's going to say it's uh, Captain Julius Mason, 5th U.S. Cavalry. During this time, the regiment was engaged in many battles, losing heavily and killed and wounded. Assistant Surgeons Porter's faithfulness to the sick and wounded is gratefully remembered by the officers and the men, and his conspicuous gallantry during the battles of Upperville, Aldi, Gettysburg, Williamsport, uh, uh, William Funkstown, Brandy Station, where he took the dead and the wounded almost from the hands of the enemy, entitles him to the greatest praise and consideration. He was under my command during all of the above mentioned battles and for his gallant conduct and faithful and intelligent services, services he is justly entitled to a brevet captaincy and a brevet majority. Um, this is the 5th U.S. Cavalry Monument at Gettysburg. Um, uh, it gets my vote for the uh, least visited monument on the battlefield, um, but he was there and um, 
just a remarkable um, service record, this, you know, 24 year old uh, doctor. On April 29th, 1864, Porter receives orders from the War Department that he's relieved of, from duty with the 5th U.S. Cavalry, and he is to report immediately to Washington, D.C. Uh, he was on the march with the Army of the Potomac, uh, moving toward battle. Uh, the Army of the Potomac had severed connections with the railroad, and for a time there was no communication with Washington. There's no replacement for him on hand, and Porter elects to serve during the Bloody Wilderness Campaign. After the battle, he remains with the wounded at Fredericksburg for a few days. And then as soon as they get the transports moving, he's placed in charge of the first train of wounded to Belle Plain. And he's all, he takes charge of the wounded and he's also assigned to deliver dispatches to um, Washington. And he proceeds with the wounded to um, the nation's capital. Uh, he is assigned to be post surgeon at the Washington Arsenal on May 1864, and he will serve in this position until 1867. This was a penitentiary before the Civil War, and it continues uh, as a um, secure arsenal for the um, federal, uh, federal government. Now, this is a picture that Porter would be very familiar with. This is the view of the Sixth Street Wharf in DC. You see the paddle wheeler there. The wounded would be offloaded onto the docks and dispersed among the hospitals of Washington, DC. Um, and Porter really loves this duty. First of all, he's not, he's not, you know, in danger of being killed uh, while serving as a medical officer. He loves the cultural life of the city. He loves history. He's a very dutiful post-surgeon. And after the rigors of the battlefield, his young wife is able to join him here in Washington. The family gets a very small house on the, on the banks of the Potomac, uh, on the arsenal grounds. They have a, a first child, Clara Elizabeth. She's born at this post on October 1864. She will live about a year. And we'll talk a little more about that. Um, the Porters did engage a nurse for the baby uh, and to help Mrs. Porter, who immediately gets pregnant again. Her name is Fanny Jackson. And um, the, the family would call her Mama Fanny. Uh, she was half American Indian and half Black and the Civil War freed her from slavery. And she's devoted to the Porters and their children. And through the years, she'd be with the family in Washington, DC, in Providence, Rhode Island, and she would come with them to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, she would be listed in the Bridgeport census of 1870 as a 41 year old domestic servant living with the Porters. Her daughter was living with the Porters and her granddaughter would be named for one of the Porter daughters. Um, she, uh, the, the census is a funny thing. They don't know how to list her in the 1800s and early 20th century. The census would always list your race. Um, one of the few things that hasn't changed because they still want to know what race you are on the U.S., but they don't want to know anything else in the census, the, the recent census, but they don't know how to mark Fanny. They mark her as Black, then they cross it out and they mark her as Mulatto, and then they cross it out and they mark her as White. So, and you can see her mixed race here uh, in her picture. I want to read to you what Dr. Porter wrote on the back of that picture that you see there. He wrote Fanny Jackson, Washington, DC with Mr., Mrs. and Dr. Porter from 1863 to 1874, a most trusty and faithful mama. She was formerly a slave of Mrs. Lieutenant Maury of the United States Coast Survey. She was sold in the early part of the war because her owner in Virginia was afraid she would be liberated by the advancing Union Army and was sent to New Orleans 
which place she reached the day after Ben Butler took the city and was returned a free woman to Washington before her far former owners knew that Butler had been successful. Her, she has a granddaughter named after Ethel, my daughter, Ethel Porter. So very close relationships. I don't know what happens. The family thinks she passed away, but I, I lost her after the um, census in the 1870s. So then the nation's joy at Lee's surrender in uh, April 1865 is absolutely shattered when President Lincoln is murdered at Ford's Theater on Good Friday, April 14th, 1865. Um, we all know he's assassinated by the well-known actor John Wilkes Booth while attending the play, Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. Um, he's shot in the head, the president is shot in the head as he watched the play, and he would die the following day at 7.22 a.m. in the Peterson House, the boarding house that was across the street from the theater. Um, Lincoln died on Saturday, April 15th. On April 18, 1865, President Lincoln lay in state in the East Room on an 11-foot-high catafalque designed by the Commissioner of Public Building, uh, Benjamin Fre French. Preparations had gone on virtually uninterrupted since the president's body was moved back to the White House. Mourners lined up outside the White House waiting for the 9.30 a.m. opening of the gates um, so that they could pass by the president's uh, 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 coffin and see him there. Um, they waited more than six hours, many of them, to pay their respects. And about 25,000 people walked through the South Portico to the entry hall in the green room before entering the East Room, which had been darkened for the occasion. The mirrors in the room were covered. Uh, and um, the frame swath in um, black crepe and black cloth also covered the walnut lead lined coffin of the president. Now, Dr. Porter had been a Lincoln supporter from the beginning. He was president in Chicago in 1860 during the first nomination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and in 1860, cast his first vote for President Lincoln. In 1864, on his way uh, east through uh, four railroad wrecks, um, he cast his second vote in Philadelphia for Lincoln's reelection. After the president is assassinated, um, Porter is with the crowd outside the White House because he's waiting to pass by the president's casket in respect. And um, they, um, he has inside his coat a roll of currency, a very thick roll of currency, and um, he forgot to deposit in the bank. Well, the crowd starts pushing forward. They start crushing everybody. A uh, sentry in front of the White House gets very nervous and lowers his bayonet and it porks Dr. Porter in the chest where he has this large roll of currency. His brother-in-law said it was $25,000. Now I always forget to put my $25,000 in the bank when I'm carrying it around in my breast pocket. But um, he was safe from uh, being seriously wounded, it was obviously a very thick roll. Uh, and um, he was very, very, very lucky. Um, so of course, there's a huge manhunt. Secretary of War Stanton conducts the manhunt that tracks down the assassins. And John Wilkes Booth will evade capture for 12 long days. He's finally cornered on April 24th, 1865. Booth and Davy Harold are surrounded in the Garrett Farm barn. Now, Lincoln is going to have his avenger, or the Mad Hatter, who would kill John Wilkes Booth against orders in the Garrett barn. Um, Boston Corbett was one of the cavalrymen selected to hunt down John Wilkes Booth, and, uh, and um, as the troops surround the barn, uh, Booth refuses to comply with orders to come out. 
and um, the cavalry sets the barn on fire. Um, Harold complies, comes out, Booth refuses to, saying they'll never take him alive. And Boston Corbett is got his gun leveled on Booth from the barn and shoots Booth in the neck against orders. He, he will be arrested for, diso the cavalryman Boston Corbett will be arrested for um, disobeying orders to bring Booth in alive, but um, he's cleared of any wrongdoing and very proud of himself. He believes he's Lincoln's Avenger. Now you see that picture there uh, with Boston Corbett and the bloody pair of scissors. Um, Boston Corbett is a, um, he is uh, not, um, not right. Uh, and um, he has mental health issues probably before he enters the army. And many historians believe they're compounded by his um, uh, work with Mercury because he's a hatter and um, he's quite unbalanced. So that picture is there because he is, becomes very religious and he, he becomes a, a, a preacher on the street corners of um, Boston and the, um, the um, prostitutes there tempt him, he says, tempt him and taunt him. And he feels tempted and he goes home uh, after one of these episodes and he self, um, he self uh, emasculates himself. Um, he does the bloody deed. Um, so clearly there's a lot of things going on with this gentleman. Um, Booth dies at the Corbett form uh, at 8.30 a.m. His uh, remains are sewn up in a horse blanket, placed on a wide plank that serves as a stretcher. A market wagon is obtained and the body is taken to Belle Plain. There it's hoisted up the side and swung upon the deck of a steamer named the John S. Idol and transported up the Potomac River to Alexandria where it's uh, transferred to a government gunboat. Um, this tug carries the, re um, the remains of Lincoln's assassin into the Washington Navy Yard. Uh, the corpse is placed aboard a monitor ship called the Montauk on April 27th. And once on board, Booth's remains are laid out on an improvised buyer. Uh, and the um, horse blanket is removed, a tarpaulin is placed over the body, and a number of witnesses are called out to the ship to identify the body. Dr. Barnes, Woodworth, and Todd perform the autopsy right on the deck of the Montauk. Um, Booth's third, fourth, and fifth surgical vertebrae, who was shot in the back of the neck, instantly paralyzed and subsequently would die uh, after that were removed during the autopsy and are housed still to this day, not on public display though, at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Now, they're in the middle of the Potomac River. There is so much going on in Washington. Um, there is a rumor that they load up a bunch of rocks in a sack and these two guys row it out into the middle of the Potomac River and pretend to throw the sack out. People are all watching this, like what's going on? Because they don't want Booth's body being taken. They want to make sure it's gone forever, but it's a big ruse if that happened. Secretary of War Stanton's orders Booth's body to be buried in the floor of the old penitentiary or the current U.S. arsenal. Now, Dr. Porter is um, going to write about this because he's going to be the officer in charge of secretly burying Booth's body. So he writes, on Thursday afternoon, April 27th, 1865, Mrs. Porter and I took a boat ride down Potomac, returning to the officer's landing at the Arsenal's grounds, which was marked by a little pier jutting into the water. At the water end of which was a summer house. The latter was used by officers, their family and guests as a waiting place uh, for boats or a spot in which to sit and enjoy the gorgeous panorama of the river. 
as we approached the pier, a sentry challenged us, ordered us away, declaring that no persons were permitted to land on the pier and that he would fire upon us if we attempted to land. I was in undress uniform and an officer of the post and the guard proving obdurate, I ordered him to call the officer of the guard who upon arriving um, uh, allowed us to pass. I noticed as we walked through in one corner, some bundles securely wrapped in a gunny sack, but it had no idea what it was, didn't ask. Um, the fact of the sentry being stationed at such an unusual post uh, naturally excited some wonderment. But in those unsettled times, we knew better than to ask questions. We knew, of course, by report that the body of Booth had been put aboard the Monitor Montauk and that his companion, David Harold, was a prisoner on board the same vessel, which was anchored off the Navy Yard in Anacostia. So, you know, Washington swirling with all kinds of conspiracy rumors. They know, uh, they think they know what's going on. They know Booth has been killed. Uh, and um, this is the Arsenal grounds, the long stately avenue. Um, Lincoln would often go here. Lincoln liked weapons. He would go here and he would test new weapons here. So Porter had seen the president here on the grounds. Well, now Porter is going to be called to secretly bury his assassin. Um, Porter writes, midnight was being called by the sentries from various posts as the military storekeeper of the arsenal, Mr. Stebbins, four enlisted men, one of them leading an, a team attached to a cart and another carrying a lantern and myself, the only commissioned offer, officer present met at the little summer house where sentry was on guard over the thing in the gunny sack. The four enlisted members were men were members of the ordinance corps and picked for their reliability and discretion. Sworn to secrecy regarding what happened during that night, two of the men picked up the gunny sack and contents and placed the body in the cart. They take the cart down that avenue that you see there. Um, it's a long way to go. Mr. Stebbins has keys to the storeroom. They open it. Now this is a former, um, this is now an arsenal. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, uh, not only heavily guarded areas, but areas that are um, safe enough to store munition and many of them have dirt floors. And um, so Porter goes on to say he unlocks a certain area. They go in, part of a hole's already been dug. They toss the body in, they rebury the body, they tamp down the, the ground, and they all leave. And nobody talks about this for many, many years. They do obey their oath of secrecy. Now, what to do, what to do with the conspirators? Um, Secretary of War Stanton initiates a very aggressive pursuit of those involved in the conspiracy and orders the arrest of hundreds of suspects and witnesses. The investigation uh, led to the apprehension of people with direct and indirect involvement of the plot. Six of the suspects, Lewis Powell, David Harold, George Astro, Ned Spangler, Michael O'Loughlin and Sam Arnold are captured and subsequently confined to Union Navy ships. The majority of the general detainees are held in the old Capitol prison in Carroll Annex. You can see the old Capitol prison there. Um, Dr. Mudd and Mary Ann Surratt are held in the old Capitol prison as well. Um, and they are considered prime suspects. Ford's theater owner, John T. Ford, Booth's brother, Junius, dozens of others are arrested immediately following us, the assassination, also held at the old Capitol prison. The prison's annex was known as Carroll Row uh, and held female prisoners. Um, beside Murray Surratt, former Confederate spies, Rose O'Neill, Greenhouse and Bell Boy. Now, the government needs a secure place to put these people, uh, and um, they decide on the old Arsenal Penitentiary 
which is going to be reactivated. Um, it had not been a prison for three years. It's going to be reactivated. It's surrounded on water uh, on three sides. It's considered one of the most secure and heavily guarded places in Washington, D.C., and had plenty of cells to accommodate prisoners and also had a room large enough to conduct the trial. This is now uh, Fort Leslie McNair, if you're familiar with current Washington lands landscape. Um, security is extremely important because it's thought that Southern spies might try to break the prisoners out and free them or, or Northern loyalists might uh, try to um, exact revenge on the prisoners. Um, Secretary of War wants them tried. He also wants them to be executed and he wants them to remain safe and healthy until they are. So President Andrew Johnson appoints 34 year old General John Hartramp to take command of the Arsenal Penitentiary. He'd serve as the Provost Marshal and Military Governor of the prison and would be responsible for the defense of the arsenal as well as supervision of every aspect of the prisoners daily lives. He would uh, make um, sure they were fed, clean, no one could communicate with them unless authorized by written orders of Secretary of War Stanton, General Hartraff, and Surgeon George Loring Porter personally inspected the, per the prisoners twice per day at 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. Secretary of War Stanton determined no prisoner will be allowed to escape alive or defeat the ends of justice by self-destruction. Porter's findings and concerns were reported daily to Hartranft verbally. Orders and concerns were also verbal because uh, they didn't want rumors spread by the multiple army clerks that needed to be involved in the process of copying written orders. So everything is highly secret. Everything is verbal from the highest to the lowest ranks. There are There is a complete uh, atmosphere of mistrust and paranoia uh, in um, Washington and all over the nation. Just want to talk about this photo for a second. This photo is taken by Alexander Gardner on July 5th, 1865, when he's given permission to enter the arsenal with advanced information from the War Department to prepare to photograph an execution. That's all he's given, and nobody even knows what the sentence is going to be. The guilty verdict and execution orders, which President Johnson approved that very day, had not been announced or even given to the condemned. And Gardner will pose Hartraft and his staff with the chairs that will be used by the condemned on the scaffold. So if you see those very famous pictures of the scaffold of the conspirators, those are the chairs that they will also sitting in. On April 25th, 1865, Gardner would photograph six of the conspirators on the ironclad Saugus, where they were being held in the middle of the Potomac River. And one by one, the conspirators were brought up on deck and seated in front of the gun turret to be photographed. Dr. Mudd and Mrs. Surratt were not photographed by Gardner and were imprisoned in the old Capitol prison before all of the prisoners are transferred to the Arsenal Penitentiary. John Harrison Surratt over there in the lower right-hand corner, Mary Surratt's uh, son, escaped to Europe, served in the Papal Guard. He's captured and tried by jury in 1867, and then he's released because the jury uh, could not reach a verdict and was hung. But the prisoners are kept hooded and shackled and stiff braced during their imprisonment. The Arsenal Penitentiary, each of their cells was separated by empty cells on either side to prevent them from tapping, to communicate with one another. Hoods prevented 
um, that them seeing and further limited communication, different hoods were used. One type was used while transporting them from their cells to the courtroom, but much more confining type of hood was used while the prisoners were in their cells. And it was a very severe hood described by Samuel Arnold. I found a differently constructed hood of a much more torturous and painful pattern than one formerly used. It fitted tightly containing cotton pads which were placed directly over the eyes and the ears having a tendency to push the eyeballs far back in their sockets. One small aperture allowed about the nose through which to breathe and one which food can be served to the mouth. Cords were drawn as tight as the jailer in charge could pull them causing the most excruciating pain. Tied in such a manner around the neck that it was impossible to remove them. The hoods never being removed except when brought before the court and always replaced on our exit. And these hoods were a torture in the heat and humidity of the Washington summer. The prisoners uh, skin chafed to the point of bleeding. Their faces swelled horribly. And Dr. Porter starts to become very, very concerned about this. President Andrew Jackson, uh, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Johnson is going to order a trial by military commission for an assassination judge and act of war. Mrs. Surratt's lawyers moved immediately for a civil criminal jury trial for her. This is denied. There were many theories about Mrs. Surratt's guilt and innocence. Some believed that because her son had fled, she was deemed guilty. President Johnson refused to hear anything of her innocence and considered Mary Surratt the one who kept the nest that hatched the egg. Modern consensus is that if Mrs. Surratt was Given a civilian uh, a jury trial, she probably would not have been found guilty and certainly would not have been hanged. Johnson's order of trial by military commission, very, con uh, very controversial. Many, including the defense counsel, deemed it unconstitutional. And the popular woodcut that you see at the left of the conspirators reflects the government's contention that Mary Surratt was the center of the conspiracy and pictures her thus. Um, Dr. Mudd is missing from the woodcut, but her son, John Surratt, who escaped capture, is at the bottom right. Um, Mrs. Surratt in her cell was not subject to wearing the hood. Uh, she was a Catholic, another problem in very Protestant leaning America. She's allowed to have spiritual comfort of a priest. In court, she appears uh, properly uh, veiled and bonneted. Um, but Dr. Porter would describe Mrs. Surratt this way. Mrs. Surratt was a striking woman and a handsome one, despite the unavoidable imprint of prison life. She kept herself in hand, despite the seriousness of her position, and gave me but little trouble. Early in her incarceration, she evinced a desire to starve herself with the possible idea of ending her life in this manner. I had a quiet, earnest talk with her, pointing out that abstinence from food would make her ill, that she was under my medical care and I should be forced to adopt means of ensuring that she received the proper amount of nourishing food at regular intervals. And there was no more trouble after that. Mrs. Surratt virtually selecting her own menu. Now, Dr. Porter is very concerned about these um, hoods. He believes that they're really contributing to some in mental instability among the um, uh, among the prisoners, um, especially for Lewis Powell who they don't want to remove his head because he keeps banging his head on, you know, he's a nut and he keeps banging his head. But Porter is really, really concerned that this is going to really drive these people insane. So he um, goes to Hart Ranch to reports to the Secretary of War and um, they call in an insanity expert from New York State to consult with Dr. Porter and um, Dr. Gray 
is his name, and Porter writes, Dr. Gray was sent for to examine the prisoners and consult with me. And Dr. Gray unhesitatingly agreed with me that a continuance of the use of hoods would be liable to cause insanity. So he reasons with Stanton, Stanton has the hoods removed. Porter says, these people need to get outside, they need exercise, um, and Stanton can consents to a schedule for that. Porter also says, look, they need to be able to read. They need to be able to, you know, have, have some privileges. And Stanton, who by this time has really had it, says, yeah, okay, okay, you get them something to read, but make sure it's not earlier or later than 1835. And you pick it all out and make sure there's nothing there that I'm going to object to. So Stan, uh, so Dr. Porter, he was a great reader himself, gets things like Robinson Crusoe for them to read and, and things like, like that. Um, it's, um, it's a really, really interesting um, construct. Um, by the way, I just want to talk about this, um, this uh, sketch here. Uh, one of the um, judges on the trial is General Lou Wallace. Um, we all know Lou Wallace wrote Ben-Hur. He's also a great artist and he sketches numerous pictures of the conspirators. And this is one, um, they are on display at his museum in um, Indiana. I don't remember exactly where, but I'll have to find that out. Um, so anyway, on July 6th, let me change this. No. On July 6th, 1865, the day after President Johnson approves the verdicts and sentences of the commission, they're copied out by hand, carried to prison by Major General Winfield Scott Hancock, and it becomes the duty of General John Hartranft, commander of the old Arsenal Penitentiary, to inform the prisoners of their fates. Around noon, Hartranft Hart walks from cell to cell and reads aloud the sentence to Lewis Powell, Mary Surratt, David Harold and George Astor that they had been found guilty and would be hanged the next day between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Hartranft then hands each of the condemned an envelope containing the copy of the death warrant. The other defendants found guilty are Samuel Mudd, Samuel Arnold, Michael O'Loughlin. These men are sentenced to life in prison and Edmund Spangler is sentenced to six years. On July 7th, Alexander Gardner and his assistant, Timothy O'Sullivan, take a series of 10 photographs using both large format camera with a collodion glass plate negatives and a stereo camera to make 3D scary stereoscopic pictures. Now here's Dr. Porter's words. All of these captives, priests, guards, and officers, nearly 20 in all, climb slowly and solemnly up the narrow steps and upon four armchairs stretching across the stage in the rear of the traps, the condemned were seated with their spiritual advisors behind them during the final preparations. The findings and warrants were immediately read to the prisoners by General Hartramp in a quiet, respectful tone, an aide holding an umbrella over him. Mrs. Surratt was placed on the right and nearest to her was Payne, followed by Harold and Astro. Mr. Mrs. Surratt was very feeble and leaned her head upon alternate sides of her armchair in nervous spasms. Her general expression was that of acute suffering. The con conspirators are gonna be bound, hooded, fitted with nooses, corner inset you see. Um, Astro, the last to be bound, recoiling as uh, he witnesses Davy Harold's noose play, placed around his neck. Dr. Porter writes, the stage is filled with people. The crisis of the occasion had come. The chairs were withdrawn. The condemned stood upon their feet and the process of tying the limbs began. Mrs. Surratt half fainted and sank back upon her attendants as an officer gathered the ropes tightly around her robes and bound her ankles. 
Payne stood as straight as one of the scaffold beams and braced himself so stoutly that this in part prevented the breaking of his neck. Harold stood whimpering at the lips and Astro in his groveling attitude began to talk while being tied. Dr. Porter wrote, the two drops fell with a slam. The four bodies dropped like a single thing. After hanging about 20 minutes, Surgeon Otis, U.S. Volunteers, Assistant Surgeon Woodward, U.S., and I examined them and pronounced them dead. In about 10 minutes, in about 10 minutes more, the bodies were cut down, placed in the pine boxes by a squad of soldiers and low lowered in the graves prepared for them. And you can see their graves prepared for them there and the scaffold. And um, the, there are pictures in the Library of Congress that you can really expand high resolution. The detail on these is just absolutely amazing. And the conspirators don't die an easy death. And there's all kinds of stuff involved with their execution. I'll give you one thing. I heard an expert say one time, nobody expected Mrs. Surratt to be, they expected her a reprieve. Um, it never came. And they didn't tie her noose very well. They didn't put the, you know, the right number of knots. It wasn't tied very stoutly. And it, 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 several of them died very agonizing deaths. So anyway, you know, all orders are verbal and Porter has done a pretty remarkable job. They're gonna reward him for it. He, um, on, he, on July 8th, the day after the execution, he meets General Winfield Scott Hancock um, strolling around the Arsenal grounds and Hancock hands him his order of promotion. Okay, so he um, is handed the promotion personally. Okay, later that day, he gets an order appear before General Hancock. Remember, all orders are verbal. So he goes to see Hancock that, that afternoon and Hancock says to Dr. Porter, you're going to see. Doesn't give him anything else, prepare for the trip. And um, Porter, surmises he's going to be escorting the prisoners who received life sentences wherever they're going to go, but Hancock will tell him nothing else. So here's what Porter writes, and these are the four prisoners. Of the surviving conspirators, still prisoners in the penitentiary, none of them knew of the tragedy which had been enacted on the afternoon of July 7th. They were deprived of their exercise for a few days. On July 16th, Mudd, Arnold, O'Loughlin, and Spangler are brought before General Hartraft in the outer prison and told the findings of the court in their cases. Mudd, Arnold, and O'Loughlin were imprisoned for life in the penitentiary in Albany. Nope, another ruse. Spangler was sentenced to six years hard labor in the same pres prison. President Johnson changed the sentence to confinement at Fort Jefferson, the dry Tortugas, but the conspirators were not told of this. At midnight, the prisoners were aroused and marched from their cells to a steamer. On the same day, the Secretary of Navy issued orders, the following order to Lieutenant William Budd, who's commanding the ship, and anyway, all secret orders. They go out to sea. Can't, the captain cannot open the orders till they're well out to sea. He's steaming north, finally gets to the point where he can open the orders and now realizes that they're going to be heading south to the dry Tortuga. So all of this, all of this is done in, um, in secret. There you see um, Fort Jefferson, uh, dry Tortugas. It's built in 1845. Um, these are obviously going to be the most famous prisoners held there. It's a national park now, still accessible only by water. So if you want to go out there, it's like Fort Sumter. You have to take a boat out there. Um, and, uh, you know, 1868. In 1868, you know, there's going to be that big yellow fever epidemic. And Dr. Mudd is going to take over um, trying to 
uh, uh, doctor the prisoners, trying to save people, um, because even the army surgeon dies from this yellow fever epidemic. Dr. Mudd takes over, um, does a great job. He, um, he su succumbs to the disease and um, uh, Arnold uh, Spangler starts to nurse him back to health. Um, and ultimately one of President Johnson's last acts of office is going to be to um, grant pardon to the surviving prisoners in um, Fort Jefferson. And they're all going to be finally released. Um, and uh, so that's that. So Porter does a great job. Combat surgeon, he has a remarkable combat career. He um, has a remarkable career um, carrying out this mission uh, to um, be the surgeon in charge of the conspirators. And upon completion of this escort duty, he's notified of his promotion to major. And it's made retroactive to March 13th, 1865. Um, he receives a furlough, and what does he want to do? He wants to come home to see his wife and his children. So he heads toward Providence, and he stops in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and he meets another Civil War surgeon, Dr. Robert Hubbard of the 17th Connecticut, and Hubbard says to him, Hubbard's about 10 years older, and Hubbard says to him, what are you going to do after the Army? What are you gonna do? You gotta do something. You better pick a good place to live, to bring up your family, to practice medicine. He goes, Bridgeport's a great place. Come to Bridgeport. Porter's like, you know, he does not wanna leave the army. He's staying in the army. He wants to make a career out of it. So, you know, they they have their, you know, their confab and, and um, Porter heads up to um, Providence to be with his wife. His um, wife is pregnant again. Baby had been, you know, you, his, his little daughter had died. He had two other sons in the meantime. And um, he, uh, he, um, he uh, you know, he carries on uh, back in Washington, D.C. at the arsenal. And then the, you know, the other shoe drops. And in 1867, he's ordered to the frontier. Now we always think of the frontier as, you know, oh, Custer's gonna get slaughtered in 1876, but this is the 1860s, 1867. You know what's going on in 1860s? It's a Red Clouds War, it's the Bozeman Trail, the Sioux are on the warp, they're all on the war path. And Porter receives orders for the frontier. So he sends his wife, and kids back up to Providence, Rhode Island with mama, um, Fanny, and he gets ready to head to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he receives orders to report to Camp Cook, Montana Territory, the upper reaches of the Missouri River, and um, it's not a good place to be. He's going to, he's a big student of history. He's reading Lewis and Clark. He's reading Shakespeare. They go up on the river and by steamboat. Um, and he's reading all about the, uh, you know, Lewis and Clark uh, journals. Um, he loves the story of Sacagawea. You know, he travels through hostile Indian territory. And one night it gets so bad now they're on this boat, but these boats, they get stuck on shoals, they, they ditch, there's always problems. The Indians can attack the boats at any time. And he, he is very keenly aware that the Sioux are on the war path, hostile encounters are to be expected. And he writes that night in his diary, thought of Maria and the little ones for a long while. Thank God they were not in this danger. And then I finally slept well no alarm through the night. So they travel up the Missouri and um, as they travel, these mosquitoes torment them day and night as they had Lewis and Clark's party over 60 years before. Um, Dr. Reach's Camp Cook, which is in the middle of nowhere 
and it's Nowheresville. Um, and he actually, he reaches it on August 17th and he has to walk over land, perhaps from the steamboat landing on the river. The last part of his trip, it's on foot. He's foot sore. He's really ashamed of the way he looks and has to report uh, to his new post on the Missouri River. And um, it's a very primitive place. It's a terrible location. He left Chicago on May 20th and arrived August 17th, 89 long days of travel. Now, this is where he is. See Camp Cook there? Fort Benton is to the left of it over there. That's the birthplace of Montana. That's where um, Thomas Francis Marr in 1867, just before Porter gets there, is going, Thomas Francis Marr, the Civil War General, the Irish Brigade. He is appointed governor of um, Montana. He drowns. We don't, don't know if he was pushed off the boat and assassinated. We don't know if he was drunk and fell off the boat, or, but there's you know, it, this is not a good place to be. Um, so at Camp Cook, he's placed in charge of the 13th U.S. Infantry as the surgeon in charge. He serves uh, during 1868. Um, he he's the medical officer. He's the officer of the day. He, you know, he does everything he could to um, make everybody's life easier. Um, you know, he's a surgeon. He doesn't have to be officer of the day, but he tries to take on these duties because there's so much hostile Indian um, activity that he tries to help out. You know, he um, he's also a great sportsman. He fishes, he hunts, um, you know, the, the post tries to have some kind of a social life. He always goes outside the fort when he's called to treat the neighboring Indians. He, you know, he delivers, I don't know how many babies. Um, in one instance, it's a chief gave the doctor, the son of one of his wives when he cured the other wife of pneumonia. Uh, and, um, you know, Dr. Porter has to try to give the baby back, which he does. He says, I have, I have papooses of my own. I don't need your papoose, you know. <laughs> um, the work is, you know, um, one time an, Indian's, uh, an Indian woman gives him as payment two scalps. Those two scalps uh, wind up in the Seaside Club in Bridgeport, and they hung there for many years, along with several of the trophy fish that Dr. Porter had uh, had um, caught. Um, so what does he do out there? It's varied. He cares for the sick. He organizes health measures. He installed a new hospital. He delivers babies. He tries to reform the drunken soldiers and officers. Um, during an Indian alarm, one of the majors, a friend of his, shoots himself in the foot. So drunkenness is a big issue out West. Um, he coaches the steward in the rudiments of me medicine. He reads the Bible to six soldiers, um, one of whom died from uh, arrow wounds in an Indian attack. He, he tries to bolster the frightened women who are petrified of the Indians um, entering the fort and slaughtering everybody. Um, and it, in one... Um, night when they are expecting an attack, he writes in his diary, not a pleasant thing to realize how easy it would for them to get into the fort or how they would conduct themselves after they got in. Um, and his daughter-in-law, Mary, writes all through his This Montana diary runs the somber note of the threatening of the Indians. Um, and again, I started to say 1868, you know, we always think of Custer, 1876, a few years later, but 1868 is just blood red warfare on the frontier and Porter is in the midst of it. Um, he finally submits his resignation in 1868. Uh, but he can't leave because there's no medical officer to replace him. So he stays on. I think what tipped the balance finally is Mrs. Um, Porter said, I'm coming out there. You come home or I'm coming out there. And I think that's the final straw. He really didn't want, he, he really loved the army, I think. And he wanted to 
be there, but um, he, uh, he, he did resign. Um, it took quite a while for uh, his replacement to arrive. And when um, the replacement finally arrives, when they finally get a medical officer, Porter sets out, instead of going back east, he sets out west to complete his journey on the Lewis and Clark Trail. And um, he travels by horseback, sometimes on foot. Um, you know, it's, it's a crazy trip. It's pretty rugged. Um, the, it, it, there's one part of the diary where the Columbia River Basin and the forests are often aflame. So wildfire out west is nothing new because he encounters it as he tries to travel to California. Um, it takes 42 days for the doctor to reach the Pacific Ocean, takes the boat, goes to San Francisco. And who's the coroner of San Francisco? It's Dr. Jonathan Letterman, who has left the army. And he calls on Letterman, they know each other. And Dr. Letterman takes him all over San Francisco. And he remarks in his diary how beautiful San Francisco really is. And then he takes another boat, go across to Panama, crosses the isthmus, and then he comes home. And he decides to live in Bridgeport with his family. And this is his house on State Street, 226 State Street. It's no longer there. Um, and he um, becomes a, a, a practicing um, physician and surgeon. He is a partner with Dr. Hubbard for five years, both former army surgeons, both remain fast friends, um, and they would mentor every young physician who came into Bridgeport. These guys were responsible for everything uh, medical in Bridgeport, but they're also they're also so like universal men, like Porter especially. He's a member of every medical society, every every um, club, he's a scientist, he's a sportsman, he likes social clubs, he writes all kinds of articles. He's also a great collector of uh, Americana, especially Washington and Lincoln objects. Um, he, uh, he owns a piece of Laura Keene's dress with Lincoln's blood on it. Um, again, a great collector. Um, he has a, um, he has General Grant's water book, which was copied by Eli Parker, the Seneca Indian, um, who was on Grant's staff. And Parker and um, Porter are good friends. And Porter's um, son remembers that General Parker used to come to Bridgeport to visit Dr. Porter. And Dr. Porter always kept a, uh, a picture on the wall of an autographed picture on the wall of Eli Parker, the great Seneca Indian chief, um, who was also in General Grant's cabinet. Um, he had a lot of documents relating to the Lincoln assassination. Um, he had a lot of mementos from his um, time on the frontier. In his old age, many people in Bridgeport remember him walking around in moccasins that he brought home with him because his shoes, I guess he was having heart problems and, you know, his shoes were too hard to wear. So he's walking around in his moccasins. He's a surgeon in the state national guard, um, medical director of the state's commanding general. Um, he's a 33rd degree Mason, a member uh, of Mollis. Uh, he's a big shot in the YMCA, the, you know, the church. He's involved in the church and he's very, very much in demand for expert legal testimony, especially in insanity cases. It, you know, it, they're just too, too much to mention. But one episode, I'm almost done, but one episode we have to talk about was Dr. Porter in galvanism. And, you know, he, um, he is very interested in everything. And galvanism is, um, uh, you know, I guess it's it's uh, it's founded in the 1780s when Luigi Galvani demonstrates that electricity applied to the muscles of dead frogs could make them twitch. So this galvanism, as applied to medicine, becomes a big fad. 
Um, at one point, you could buy medical devices, little self-generating medical devices. I have a couple of them at home. They're, they're the panacea to treat everything. If you're bald, if you have cancer, if you're fat, if you're skinny, if you, you know, whatever. It, this, these, these electrical devices will, um, will treat you. They're the panacea for everything that ails the human race. And you know what? We laugh, but think about my think about electricity and modern medicine you know the aeds the electrocardiograms the e, you know eegs the electrotherapy i mean this is the dawn they're experimenting now porter had experimented on rats when he was out on the frontier he was trying to like uh, transfer their tails, like if I could transplant a tail on a rat, would it, you know, so he does all this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, now we can transplant fingers and body parts and, you know, so he's, he's trying, but he's always curious, he's always seeking knowledge, and um, so he gets his, he's fascinated by galvanism, he gets his chance when they're going to execute a convicted insane murderer at the North Avenue jail in Bridgeport. And um, I'm going to just tell a little story. We always call that, we remember that Victorian building, we call it the college on North Avenue. Now it's since burned down, so it's, but it was a beautiful building. And there's going to be uh, an execution in the courtyard that the condemned is interviewed and asked what he thinks about an autopsy. And he says, well, as long as it's a trusted doctor, well, who's more trusted than Dr. Porter? So they let Dr. Porter set up a laboratory in um, one of the areas of the prison and um, the condemned is hung. Dr. Porter pronounces him dead. He's transferred to the laboratory and they do um, electrical experiments on him. Dr. Porter does, uh, you know, a remarkable job of um, documenting, um, but, you know, it's not going to reanimate this man back to life. The man's uh, neck is broken and, you know, he, man Porter manages to inflate the guy's lungs and make the, you know, his arms move and things like that. But even Porter says, forget it. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, he does have a second chance about eight years later when there's an Italian criminal condemned to death and Porter thinks he might have another opportunity to do this, but the Italians go crazy. The church gets involved. They import rioters from New York City and they wind up burying the um, guy. His name is Palladino, which is kind of a relationship name for us and they wind up burying him in um St. Augustine Cemetery across from Rem where the Remington shot tower is. Dave knows where this is. Yeah, so that's where it is. So Dr. Porter doesn't get another chance. But you know what? As the years pass, these guys honor their secrecy oath. But by 1900, Porter does start to lecture on the Lincoln assassination. He corresponds with um, different people who were involved. And in 1910, um, General Thomas Ecker, who had been the telegraph superintendent of the War Department, Lincoln trusted him, and he was assistant secretary of war, um, passes away. And all the misinformation starts to spread, and Porter decides it's time to start, you know, debunking some of the mythology about Booth's death and burial. And he writes, I have noticed in some of the obituary notices of General Eckhart, the statement that he was the only surviving man who knew all the facts of one of the greatest secrets of the Civil War, the disposition made of the body of John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of Abraham Lincoln. So he wrote his big article, um, he would lecture, he called it the tragedy of the nation. He wrote his big article very dramatically um, titled, How Booth's Body Was Hidden, The True Story Told 
for the first time in the Colombian, blah, blah, blah. And it's a very lavishly illustrated article. You can get it online. It's very interesting. Um, some of the artifacts and the illustrations were from the doctor's own Lincoln collection um, and um, responding to press reports about his death, Porter uses Mark Twain's famous phrase, the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. Um, and he would receive like almost daily mail for people writing to him about the assassination. And he makes a, a mistake himself. He writes that Captain Christian Rath, who was the um, executioner of the Lincoln assassins, had passed away. Well, that wasn't so. And um, Captain Rath responds to a friend. He states about Porter's statement in the Columbia Magazine. I, I can't see what I can add or take away from it. Somewhat surprised to hear from you, but don't worry about my death. I'm still here and smile as I write this. So, you know, Maria dies in 1915. Porter always said, well, she went to the other room. They had, they had a happy um, marriage. Um, this is part of her obit. Uh, in 1862, Dr. Porter was united in marriage to Miss Catherine Maria Chafee of Protestant, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, whom it is fair to believe he met, loved, wooed, and won while at Brown University. For more than 50 years, they lived, loved, labored together. Their home life was sweet, courteous, and dignified with gracious hospitality. Their union was blessed with 12 children, seven daughters and five sons of these children, but to survive them. There are six grandchildren, uh, one of whom, Miss Ethel Dickinson, is studying medicine in Philadelphia. So he's very lonely, but he still has the zest for life life that almost everybody remembers. He had remained close to his two siblings his whole life long. And they, um, in 1916, all in their 70s, recreate the childhood picture that was taken of them in the 1850s. Porter remains active. He loves to hunt and fish, loves his family. He loves his profession of medicine and surgery. You know, he still has that pioneer spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a man of letters, he's a historian, he's acclaimed. Um, and you know what, his body just slows down. Um, he has a lot of people in Bridgeport remembered his home because he would invite them in, he'd show them around, he'd show them all his artifacts. He loved when kids came to the house, especially the school children. And one of the little kids is being shown around with his class and he says, Dr. Porter, Dr. Porter, you must be so proud to have fought with General Washington. And mm -hmm. poor, Porter loved it. It's like Mrs. Romano being asked if she remembered the dinosaurs. Remember that, Mrs. Romano? Oh my God. So, you know, uh, he just, um, he has great hopes for the future still. Uh, you know, he just is a great guy. In 1917, um, you can see, if you do any research about the First World War, um, there was a military census in 1917, uh, and um, uh, every man over the age of 17 had to fill one out. So if you're doing any kind of research, you can find out so much. I mean, even Dr. Porter, he's aged and he fills this out. He really wanted to go back into the army. Instead, his two grandsons go and he hangs the two stars in his window in State Street for his grandson's service. Um, but um, that's how we found out, uh, that's how we found out Uncle Tommy was uh, in reform school. <laughs> um, but anyway, on February uh, 24th, 1919, he's almost, 81 years old, he, he makes the road's last turn. During the uh, last year of his life, Dr. carried in the pocket of his vest a slip of paper on which he had written, I shall go old, I shall grow old, but never lose life's vest because the road's last turn will be the best. Now, during the winter of 1919, 
He wanted to try to ease some of his breathing problems, and he went with his sister Mary and her husband to his usual winter spot in Stewart, Florida, where he loved to fish. But the weather was freezing cold in Florida that year. Um, it did not bring the usual warmth and comfort to Dr. Porter. And a few days before he died, he began writing a very long letter, which wound up being unfinished. Um, the letter remained unfinished and unsigned. Uh, he had been confined to his room for a few days. He had a cold. He didn't want to come down for supper or even to play cards, which was very unusual for him. On May 24th, his sister Mary came into his room with another doctor friend of his, and Dr. Porter opened the door, welcomed them. He resumed his seat. His sister sat next to him on the couch, and he rested his head against his sister. And when she put her arms around him, he smiled and he fell asleep. And his life had been long and full. He made the, road la the road's last turn and it was the end to a noble and notable life. And thank you very, very much.